Joshua is a former youth pastor who converted to Islam, and he is giving people reasons to reject the deity of Christ. So for Muslims, he wants to show them that they are correct for rejecting the deity of Christ, and he wants to send a message to Christians as well that we are wrong, that our beliefs about Jesus are false. And Sam, yes. if our beliefs about Jesus are false, we want to know, right? By the grace of God, I want to know, and I pray he gives me the grace to then correct myself and turn away from all falsehood because I'm going to answer to the Lord, and I want to make sure that I do so with a clear conscience. Yep. So if someone like Joshua comes along and can give us good evidence that something we believe is wrong, we're not going to say, oh, what a, what a hate monger. Oh, why does he hate us? Why does he despise us by uh, sharing this information with us, right? Yeah, no, actually, I, I actually study the arguments of those who don't believe in the Trinity and I try to study with an open mind and I'll be honest with you uh, I have yet to find anything convincing to refute what we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity provided it's accurately defined and represented so but I'm willing I'm willing to hear the best arguments against the Trinity provided it's a biblical argument mm -hmm. and not simply just philosophical in nature and I'm pointing this out because what happens when we tell Muslims about Muhammad, right? Even if we're quoting directly from their sources, even if we're quoting what the Quran says, uh, if we tell Muslims about Muhammad and Aisha or Muhammad and uh, his many other wives or Muhammad and Jihad, what, what happens when we tell Muslims about this? They say, oh, thank you for sharing what our sources say and correcting our false beliefs because we believe that Muhammad is a perfect moral example and that, and that he's a peaceful man of tolerance. Uh, what, what happens when we share basic facts from Islamic sources with well, our Muslim friends? Where we're liars, we're deceivers, we're Islamophobes, we're children of Satan, and may God destroy us because we are enemies of Islam. You know, and uh, Allah give us victory over against you guys. And, uh, <laughs> and just, to, just, to be, just to be clear, we don't want to make blanket statements, yes, so exactly. there are definitely exceptions. There are people, I just got an email this morning you saw from a Muslim in another country thanking me for sharing with him the facts about Muhammad and Aisha. He's still a Muslim, but he asked me for more information. So there are certainly exceptions. Uh, but, but in general, when we start uh, quoting the Quran and the Hadith to Muslims to tell them more about their prophet, they really do not like it. And so we're hoping that you, our viewer, whether you're Christian or Muslim or whatever you are, uh, we're hoping that you have an open mind. If we say something that is established, that, that, that we can show you factually, we hope you'll receive it. If we say something that's an error, point it out to us. Please point it out to us. Yes. Uh, send us a message and say you guys are wrong and we can show you that you're wrong. We've been responding again to Joshua Evans, and we've responded to a number of his arguments already. We haven't actually found anything that would be remotely plausible. Most, most of it is not just difference of, you know, Islam versus Christianity. It's just he does not know what the Bible says in a lot of instances. Exactly. He does not know what the doctrine of the Trinity is, exactly. and he's rejecting it based on his own misunderstanding and not on what the evidence says, right? Yeah, we'll see more examples of that in some of these other clips, and again, some of these clips do disturb me, and some of these clips make me laugh because I can't understand for the life of me how someone who claims to have been a Christian youth pastor to be so, so ignorant of the doctrine of Trinity. Because, again, for the sake of charity, I'll say he was ignorant, mm -hmm. which explains why he left Christianity, because he didn't know Christianity. He didn't know the true God. He didn't know who the Lord Jesus was. He didn't know what the Bible taught concerning the Trinity. He didn't even know what the Trinity consisted of, so he became a Muslim. Now, if he did know his faith, then what he's doing is shameful. Mm -hmm. So, but for the sake because of it charity, would be deception. Those are the alternatives. Yeah, oh, yeah. When, 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 when you, when you, and this, is, this isn't true just of uh, Joshua. This is true uh, of us or anyone else. If we say something that's just completely wrong and false, and obviously factually false, you could look it up and know not just that we have a difference of opinion that what we're saying is false. Then there are only two possibilities: either we don't know that it's false, or we do know that it's false, right? If we don't know that it's false, okay, then then we're ignorant. If we do know it's false and we're saying it anyway, then we are deliberately deceiving people. And so when Sam says he's being generous and charitable by saying that uh, maybe Joshua just didn't know what he was talking about, maybe he no. was ignorant, then that's the best interpretation because the alternative is that Joshua does know what he's saying is false, and then we, we, we've got some problems. Um, but all right, let's go to our first <coughs> clip of this show. Joshua is going to... Um, Give us some reasons to reject the doctrine of the Trinity. This one is pretty interesting. Let's see what Joshua has to say. Um, right before we get to number four, you were just speaking about how, you know, everyone should be able to understand this. This concept of Trinity cannot be explained to a child. Let's take a six, seven-year-old child and explain to him the Trinity. He would never grasp that concept. 
And God's way of life is something that sh is for everyone. It should be able to be explained to someone who is illiterate. It should be able to explain to someone who has a PhD in rocket science. It should be able to explain to a child. It should be able to explain to a deaf person. But you cannot explain this concept of Trinity. This is Joshua's test for sound theology. Can a six-year-old understand it? Oh, yeah. Um, now, 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 now the, uh, first, let me, just, let me just point out the utter, utter hypocrisy. If you explained all of Islamic theology to a child, would he be able to understand it? Definitely not. Especially in fact, Salafi Islam, right? And, in fact, um, on the next program, we're going to look at some uh, clips where Joshua points out that Allah is outside time. Could a child understand what it's like to exist outside of time? Yeah, precisely. How, how do you I, I have no idea what it would be like to exist outside. Now, just to be clear, I agree with Joshua that God is outside of time. But that's not the sort of thing I could ever explain and get a child to understand. So according to Joshua, yeah. it must be false. We're both wrong. Islam and Christianity are both false. Precisely. Now, uh, just think about this, this test. Because watch, the, did you catch the little shift he did right there. He said, you know, you should be able to explain this to a child. God's message of salvation is going to be clear. Now think about that. We're talking about God's nature. When we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity, we're talking about God's nature. And Joshua seems to, understand, seems to think that, the, you know, God's message that he's delivering to human beings, well, that he's going to make that as clear as possible. There's a difference between God making his message of salvation clear. Jesus died for your sins, so accept the offer. There's a difference between that and God's nature, right? God Precisely. doesn't God doesn't decide his nature. God doesn't say, let me make my eternal nature uh, something that people can easily understand. Precisely. Exactly. And notice uh, Joshua's Joshua's argument, right? So since he's talking about the nature of God, and he's saying, well, God would make that, God would make his nature easy for everyone to understand, as if God creates his own nature. I mean, this is just beyond silly, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. But think, if we actually took Joshua's reasoning seriously. Yeah. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. You're going to be able to explain quantum mechanics to a six-year-old? I'd like to see that. If you get the greatest, <laughs> the greatest theoretical physicist in the world, is he going to be, ex be able to explain quantum mechanics to a child? Well, Will he be able to explain Einstein's general theory of relativity to a child? Yeah. Will he be, be able to explain the basic teachings of particle physics to a child? Will he be able to explain how electricity works to a child, to a six-year-old? No, you won't be able to explain any of that to a child. That's all false. It's, it's be all false. false. It's all wrong it because a child be. can't understand it. And you, you, you see why this is such a problem. I mean, think about what he's doing. Oh, those Christians, they have a difficult concept of God. It can't be true. God can't be difficult for a human mind to understand, right? God can't be harder than basic science to understand, right? God's going to be easy to understand, something you can really get your mind around. Let me tell you, everyone. If someone comes up to you with a definition of God and you say, oh, yeah, I get it, so easy to understand, you have just been introduced to a false God that's been invented by human Precisely. minds. Yeah. Humans invent gods that we would just, oh, yeah, 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 he's just like us. He's just so easy to understand, yeah. right? Yeah. So what do you, what, what do you, what what, do you want to say? What I wanted to say, because you, 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 you touch on a lot of interesting points and in showing the utter fallaciousness of his reasoning. But I want, and I just want to add certain things. And again, as is my habit, I just beg the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, the beloved Son of God, our Lord and Savior, to anoint both you and me and the power of His Holy Spirit to represent what Muslims believe accurately and to interpret scriptures correctly for the glory, honor, and praise of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus, protect us from error and purify our motives for His glory in Jesus' name. I always have to invoke the grace of God because apart from the Lord, we are nothing, absolutely nothing. So He gets the glory for everything good we do. Um, it's interesting, he said, that God would make His nature as clear as possible. And as you just rightly and stated, God, by nature, is incomprehensible. He's above and beyond our ability to fully comprehend. This is not just a biblical uh, teaching. It's not just that the Bible says that God is beyond our ability to fully comprehend because we're finite creatures, and it takes an omniscient mind to understand God fully and completely. The Quran itself says the same thing. The Quran actually says that Allah is unlike anything in creation. Now, I'm just going to look at a few biblical references. There are two statements in the Quran. Now, if you want to read them, I'll just mention them. It's chapter 42, verse 11 of the Quran. Chapter 42, verse 11, and chapter 112, verse 4, that basically state Allah is unlike anything in creation. 
He cannot be compared to anything in creation. In fact, let me just take a moment uh, to read 112.4. Now notice this. I'm reading the Halali Khan version, 112 verse 4. There is none co-equal or comparable unto him. You can't like him to anything because he's unlike anything in creation. So if you're dealing with a being who, who says quite plainly he's unlike anything in creation, expect to find things about his existence, about his nature, about his actions, that will be above and beyond your ability to fully comprehend because he's unlike anything that you see and experience. And secondly, you are finite and limited to demand of a limited finite creature to fully comprehend the infinitude, the majestic and glorious essence of God. That's utterly fallacious. It's foolish and it's contrary to Islam. See, that's what's troubling. I mean, if Islam did teach that you could fully comprehend the essence of God, we'd have a problem with that. But it doesn't even teach it. It agrees with Christians and agrees with the Bible over against Yusha Evans. For the sake of time, let me just look at two passages real quickly from the scriptures that talk about God being unlike anything in creation and beyond our ability to fully comprehend. Isaiah 40, verse 18. Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare him with? Sure sounds like what I just read from the Quran, correct? To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare him with? That's Isaiah 40, verse 18. Isaiah 40, verse 25. Isaiah 40, verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Now this will be relevant a little later in discussion when he brings up the mm -hmm. analogy of the chariot. We'll talk yeah, about yeah. that. But that's, now, the next, that's the next clip we'll look at. All right, now Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, just for the sake of time. Now, there are a plethora of biblical passages that emphasize the point that God is unlike anything in creation and beyond our ability to fully comprehend. But again, for the sake of time, let me just look at Ephesians 3, 18 to 19. Here's what the blessed Apostle Paul, the servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, says. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, mm -hmm. that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So let me ask you a question, David. Mm -hmm. If Christ's attribute of love, he's, he's singling out just one characteristic of Christ, is, is beyond our ability to fully comprehend, surpasses knowledge, how much more should we expect God to be incomprehensible when we analyze the full essence of God? If a single attribute surpasses knowledge, what about God in all his fullness? Yeah, according to uh, Joshua, it should be very easy to understand. It's God's right. nature, and God's going to make his nature as easy to understand as possible, right? All right. Now, I just want to point out one more inconsistency because he's wrong according to both Christianity and Islam, right? Yep, exactly. And he's wrong according to what he says. He says things like God is timeless when there's no way he could ever explain that to a child. Precisely. But he, he, he's thinking of the message, right? The, the message, what, what, what it teaches. God's going to make that as clear as possible. Is it true that the Quran is as clear as possible and that a six-year-old can understand it? In fact, no man can understand parts of the Quran, right? Yeah. And that's not according to me. That's according to the Quran. Let me read chapter 3, verse 7 of the Quran. He, talking about Allah, he it is who has revealed the, to thee the book, to Muhammad. So he it is who has revealed to thee the book of which there are some verses that are clear and are the essence of the book and others ambiguous. Wait, there are ambiguous verses? There are unclear verses in the Quran? By the way, that's wow. the, the essence of the book there. That's the mother of the book, yes, right? Yes, Kitab, yeah. Oh, I guess, uh, I guess uh, the Quran has a mother, right? That too is confusing, right? Yeah, that, so it's Allah confusing. Allah it clear? What do you mean that the Quran has a mother or the mother of the book? What? what, what? It's not clear, right? I don't know what that It's means. not clear what the mother of the book is, and we don't know because there are unclear verses in the Quran, according to the Quran. So notice, this is not, this is not the essence of Allah. This is not exploring Allah's deep nature. This is His message. This is Allah's word. His word to His followers and... There, it's not clear. There are, so, there are parts of the Quran that are not clear. So according to Yusha Effens, since the Quran admits the message is not clear, it cannot be true, it cannot be from God, according to his own argument, right? That's if he were to be consistent. Yeah, and great, Muslims aren't right. exactly consistent. When they attack Christianity, it's one method, and then they turn to Islam, and it's a completely different method, right? And by the way, to make it even harder, to make things more complicated, we are not given, we're not even given a list of which verses are ambiguous. Yeah, so it's not clear which verses are clear yeah, and which so verses are unclear. Exactly. So it's not clear which verses are unclear, right? And yet, according to Yusha Evans, the message has to be clear, but the Quran then fails his own test. Good so, job, Yusha Evans. Yes. Joshua wants to be consistent. He now has to reject Islam. But we've seen that over and over again already. Yes. All right, let's, uh, let's have one more example that Sam just referred to. Let's see the next clip and see what uh, he's going to add for us. 
But you cannot explain this concept of Trinity. There was a British man, and it was one of the most interesting parables that I had ever read and come across. It was a uh, British professor named Richard Parsons, mm -hmm. and he was debating this concept of Trinity with a friend of him who was a Trinitarian. And they were debating this issue, and a carriage came along, and it had three people in it. And the friend, the Trinitarian, said, look, look, there's a good example of the Trinity. One carriage, three people in it. He said, no, you want to show me the Trinity? Show me one person in three carriages. <laughs> one person in three carriages. He said, then I'll believe your Trinity. Show me one person that's in same person in three different carriages. <laughs> now, notice what uh, he's doing, Sam. Yeah. Show me something in creation that's like your God. And yeah. if you can't show me something in creation that's like your God, well, I'm going to reject your God. That's what he said, isn't it? Precisely. And in doing so, he goes against the Quran. Let me read the other verse. Remember, I read 112 verse 4, right? Mm -hmm. There is none co-equal or comparable unto him. That's 112 verse 4 of the Quran. Chapter 42 verse 11. Chapter 42 verse 11. Now, again, notice, he wants us to point to something in creation that's identical to the nature, essence, existence of God. In other words, he's assuming that Allah and his creation are comparable, right? But then 42 verse 11, notice what it says. The creator of the heavens and the earth, he has made for you mates from yourselves and for the cattle also mates. By this means he creates you in the wombs. There is nothing like unto him. And he is the all hearer, the all seer. Nothing like unto him. But according to Yusha Evans, in order for the Trinity to be true, there has to be something identical to it in creation. If not, then the Trinity cannot be true. But the Quran itself it says that there's nothing like Allah. Now I'm not saying that Allah is triune. What I'm saying is if he's consistent again, if he's going to apply his criterion consistently, since the Quran says Allah is unlike anything creation, that means you can't point to anything that you, you compare with Allah. Allah can't be God. He cannot exist according and, and, to his argument. I mean, we, we could even apply this to, to Joshua's description of Allah. Allah is timeless. Sam, show me something that's timeless. Yeah. Or I reject right. Islam right now. Yeah, okay. You're going to have to reject it. <laughs> show me something that's all powerful right now. Show me something that's all powerful, Sam. Can't do it. Show me something that sees without actually having eyes, without light entering can't, into the eye. Can't, can't you do can't it. do it. See, you, you guys are saying all this. He's arguing like an atheist when he comes to Precisely. Christianity. When he approaches Christianity, uh, show me something that's like that. Show me something in the physical world. Oh, you can't do that. Then all this talk of God is just nonsense. Precisely. Right? Yeah, very but interesting. he would never do that with Islam. Never. Well, because that, he'd have to reject if Islam. He, if he did, he wouldn't be a Muslim, right? He wouldn't be on a Muslim show trying to convince Christians to embrace Islam. If he's consistent, he'd either become atheist, agnostic, or embrace some type of belief in God, but not Christianity, not Judaism, not Islam, if he's consistent. And by the way, that, that analogy, uh, whatever, whoever this person was, show me one person, three characters, that again is a gross misrepresentation of what Christians believe. I don't believe God is one person in three char characters, characters, one person yeah. in three, di uh, three different modes. I believe he's three distinct persons, eternally existing as the one God in perfect and separable fellowship. Now you believe that based on what God has revealed Precisely. through Jesus Christ, right? Yes. But according to Joshua, in order to believe that, we'd have to find something in creation that's like that. Yeah. There goes Islam, Christianity, There Judaism. goes Islam, Christianity. Uh, but now let's see where Joshua is going with this, because he's going to point out that, God, that our view has to be false according to the Bible because of what he says in this next clip. Let's take a look. It's a concept that, and that you can't explain. It's unexplainable. One plus one plus one equals one. Or one times one times one equals one. All these things, the egg with the yolk and the coat and the shirt, all, you know, these are things that is not understandable by anybody unless you have some rocket science PhD and then they would even be confused. So God's, and even in the Bible, even in the Bible, God says he is not the author of confusion. So if that is confusing him, someone else must have altered this whole idea. Well, there you have it, Sam. Yeah. Attempts to explain the doctrine of the Trinity by peeling to something like an egg they fail. They don't do the job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. God is not like an egg, so our, our view must, That's it. must, gotta uh, be false. Mu must be false. But notice what he did there. Our definition of God is confusing. It's confusing, and according to the Bible, he is a former youth pastor and must therefore be an expert in the scriptures, Got right? It, yeah. According to the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. So yeah. since our definition of God is confusing, unlike saying that Allah is timeless, right? Since our doctrine of God is confusing, God is not the author of confusion, therefore God did not author this 
doctrine it's of the Trinity. What would be the problem with that, that any youth pastor should actually yeah. know? That's, that's, again, this is what I've been concerned hearing his presentation. Again, he claims to be a youth minister. Now, if he was simply someone who grew up in a Muslim home, then I can understand his blatant ignorance of the scriptures and the context of the passages that he's wrenching out of context. For example, the, the statement, God is not a God of confusion, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And if you read the context, 26 to 33, what Paul is actually saying is that God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, because he's addressing he's chaotic and, and unorganized worship in the church, that people are coming to church and they're speaking out of turn, and so they're, they're adding confusion and chaos. And so what Paul is telling them in context, and anyone can check the context, go to 1 Corinthians 14, read from 26 all the way down to 35, and you'll see the context is about orderly worship. The Christians were worshiping in a disorderly manner. They were chaotic, adding to confusion, adding to division. And Paul says to them, look, the God you serve is not a God of disorder. That's what he means by God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of disorder, but of peace. So he wants you to be united. He wants you to worship him in orderly conduct, not disorderly, not people speaking out of turn, a person getting up and saying a word and then someone cutting him off. But orderly worship, because God is a God of order, not disorder, that's the contextual meaning of this passage. To further prove that Paul is not saying, that Paul is not denying that God's nature is beyond comprehension and therefore will be confusing to finite creatures, let me read to you what he says in Romans 11, 33-36. So, so you know that's not Paul's point. Paul is not saying, oh, God is not a God of confusion, therefore there's nothing about God's nature that will be confusing to finite creatures Especially when in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 10, he, see, he says we see dimly, right? And we only know in part. We don't know fully. Same book, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10, right? We only perceive dimly. We only know in part. We don't fully know. But when the perfect comes, then we shall know as we are known. So he's even telling you our understanding, our perception of God is limited. It's imperfect, and we don't see as clearly as we should. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. But Romans 11, 33, 36, same author. Romans 11, 33, 36. And by the way, and what's interesting, just a side comment, side comment, in the previous shows we, show, we saw that he claims that Paul invented the doctrine of the Trinity. So now he's pitting Paul against Paul. The same Paul who created the doctrine of the Trinity is now making a statement to undermine the very doctrine that he supposedly created. And it's authoritative. It's, Paul's authoritative when he says God is not the author of confusion. So that means we can trust him in that regard, but when it comes to the Trinity, we can't trust him because he didn't know Jesus, never met him, never saw him. Even though Muhammad is prophet, who comes 600 years later, never saw Jesus, never met him, and never met the eyewitnesses to Christ. But Joshua's not picking and choosing, is he? No. He's no, not he's ripping very, things out of context. No, he? he's being very consistent. Okay. So let me, let me just read this passage, and we'll go to the next point. Oh, the depths, Romans 11, 33, 36. Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Could Paul be any clearer that God's ways, his riches, his wisdom are unsearchable, unfathomable? Could he be any clearer? Uh, no, and you would expect a former youth pastor to have some familiarity with the scriptures he's quoting, right? I mean, you would expect someone to know what Paul's saying when he's talking about God not wanting chaotic worship of people jumping up out of turn and so on. You would expect him to know what that verse means in context, and you would expect, him to, you would expect a youth pastor to know that when Paul says this, you shouldn't interpret it in a way that totally rips it out of context and totally contradicts everything else Paul says, exactly. right? Yeah. And I have to point out, we, we have to hold um, Joshua consistent here. If he's saying God is not the author of confusion, and that means that God is not going to reveal anything that's confusing, what did we read from the Quran in chapter 3, verse 7? Yeah. God has revealed verses that only he understands, right? Confusing. Pe human beings do not understand. So if you try to understand them, you will just be confused. Therefore, God is not the author of the Quran. Joshua Evans has just told everyone, reject this book because there are, according to this book, confusing passages in this book, and therefore God cannot be the author of this book. Interesting what happens when you are consistent. Yeah, when you are consistent, yep. 
All right, let's go ahead to the next clip because the, the, these are kind of these are these are kind of silly things. Uh, you know, if your doctrine of God cannot be understood by a six-year-old, it can't be true. These are really really silly kinds of objection. Then not even understanding a you know basic passages of scripture that that I mean you don't have to be a pastor to understand these. Um, so there are some kinds. There 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 these are kind of silly kinds of objections. But he is going to give us something a little more substantial. He's going to start quoting Jesus to show that he, G, that Jesus is not divine. So and let's go ahead into the next clip and see that, what he has for us. Let's see. Come on. So talk to us, brother. Number four is that Jesus explicitly states that he is not God. Now we think that Jesus implicitly states that he is God. There are some ambiguous verses, but what about where he explicitly states that he is not God? For instance, in John 17 and 3, he said, and this is life eternal. This is the way to eternal life that they may know you, the one true God, one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent as a messenger. Now, uh, Sam, um, yes, I I'm going to yes. give a, a quick little introductory criticism of this point, and then you can go into more detail because this is a, this is a fairly common, it's not the most common criticism, but we, we, we've heard this several times before. And notice, one, he had to distort what that verse actually said in order to give it an, an Islamic meaning. And he certainly had to rip it out of context. He certainly has to rip it out of the context. But let me just point out what the verse actually says. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He doesn't say this is the way to eternal life. Knowing God and Jesus, and there is a distinction there. If he wants to make a point, he should make the point based on the distinction there. God, the Bible is distinguishing there between God and Jesus. So if you want to build your argument, build your argument there. But notice, even, a, even if we go with that, eternal life is knowing, not knowing about, is knowing exactly. God and Jesus, right? Knowing Jesus is part of eternal Precisely. life, exactly. right? Not knowing Jesus' message, right? And, no, and notice what he, what he, what, how he had to end it. He said, uh, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent as a messenger. Is, is it say as a messenger no, here? No, actually, uh, no. far from so it. So he's, he's adding an Islamic thrust to this. But notice what happens, because we've seen this several times already from Joshua Evans. He's arguing that a verse refutes the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, when if he would just read the passage, he would see the passage only makes sense in light of the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Incarnation, right? Precisely. Because let me read verse 5. And then Sam can, Sam can uh, expand upon things. Jesus says two verses later. So Joshua Evans quotes chapter 17, verse 3. I'll quote chapter 17, verse 5. Now, Father, so Jesus is addressing his Father in this passage. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Before the world created. Jesus says just two verses after the, the verse that uh, Joshua Evans quoted and then misrepresented. Jesus says that he had glory with the Father before creation, before the world was created. He was there with the Father and he had his glory. And the only way to make sense of this is that he then laid aside this glory to enter into creation. That's the rest of the rest of the book of John right there. Precisely, yeah. And now he's returning to get to receive back that glory that he laid aside in order to come into this world. Sam, does that make any sense apart from the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation? Definitely not. In fact, uh, Jesus' statement right there proves that Islam is false and Muhammad has to be a false prophet. Now notice, he's quoting these passages to try to convince us. Jesus is not God, but a messenger sent from Allah. In other words, his intention is to prove from these statements Islam is true. Well, again, if he's going to be consistent, he's going to have to abandon Islam again. Because notice what you read in John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. I challenge Yusha Evans and any Muslim listening to cite a single passage from the entire Bible, Old or New Testaments, or even from the Quran, where a messenger says to God, glorify me together with yourself with the glory that you and I both together shared before the world came into existence. Can you find such a statement from any of the messengers? Can you find such a statement from Muhammad? You know the answer, you can't because that would be blasphemy. Because according to the Quran, according to Islam, and the Bible agrees, God does not share His glory with any creature, no matter how exalted, because God alone is to be glorious, God alone is to be exalted, God alone is to be acknowledged as the one God, as the one creator of all. And yet here Jesus, who's supposedly just a messenger, mind you, and He's trying to prove a, a human messenger. He's not even trying to prove that He's a pre-existent spirit creature, just a human messenger. 
And yet he says to God, glorify me. And if you go back and look, at it's an imperative actually. It's, if you go, it's in the imperative mood. It's actually a command, but it's not being disrespectful. It's reverently saying to the Father, glorify me. Give me back the glory I had with you before the world was. So Jesus existed in the same glory with the Father before the world came into being. How in the world is this compatible with Islam? I don't know. It's going to get a little worse. If you just go to John 17, 1 or 2, you emphasize the fact eternal life is dependent on knowing, not just knowing about, knowing of, knowing intimately, personally, not just God, but Jesus Christ, His Son. The reason why you have to know Jesus in order to have eternal life, Jesus tells you in John 17, verses 1 to 2. Let's read it. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, has said, said, Father, notice again, referring to God as Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son. Can you imagine Moses saying to Yahweh, glorify Moses, glorify me. Or Muhammad saying, Allah, glorify me. That the Son may glorify you. Notice it's reciprocal. The Son glorifies the Father, the Father glorifies the Son. The Father glorifies the Son the same way the Son glorifies Him. That's reciprocal. Jesus can only say that if they are essentially co-equal, right? Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Now watch this. Even as you gave Him the Son, you, Father, gave the Son authority over all flesh. Let me ask David a question. Since the Father has given the Son authority over all flesh, was Muhammad flesh? Mm -hmm. And if Jesus the Son has been given authority over all flesh, does that mean that Jesus has authority over Muhammad? That means Jesus owns Muhammad. And all Muslims? And all Muslims. All human beings. Including Joshua Evans. You got it. So that very same chapter proves Jesus is the divine son who shares the same divine glory with the father who has sovereignty over all flesh which includes every human being including Muhammad and Joshua and all Muslims and then he says and all and that to all whom you have given him he the son may give eternal life let me ask you another question what kind of characteristics must Jesus have in order to be able to give eternal life not just life that in itself would be amazing eternal life, never-ending life, perfect life in the presence of God forever to everyone that the Father gives Him. Jesus would need the omni-attributes, omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. And this is the chapter that Yusha Evans is trying to quote to prove that Jesus denied His deity? In a book that begins by declaring, in the beginning was the Word, the Word, the word, the word was, was with God. God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. Again, this is a coherent message throughout. Precisely. It's telling you that there is a plurality within the one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son enters into creation. The Word became flesh. And then, after Jesus has completed His work, He says He's going to get back the glory, that He gives eternal life, that He is the Son, that He's going back to get back the glory that He had with the Father before the world ever existed. Joshua goes right to a verse, smack dab in the yeah. middle of all this, <laughs> completely rips it out of context, ignores the fact that this is knowledge of Jesus is required for eternal life. Not Jesus knowledge about Jesus, life. knowing Jesus is required for eternal life. He says, you see there, this refutes the Christian doctrine and supports Islam because uh, according to Islam, it's father and son, right? As yeah. this passage declares. Actually, in chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, it says that Allah will fight, Allah will damn, Allah will destroy, all the Christians who say that the Messiah is the Son of Allah, that's chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran. Because in the Quran, Jesus is not the Son, and Allah is the Father to no one. And that's also found in chapter 5, verse 18, where the Jews and Christians say, we are the children of Allah, His beloved. Chapter 5, verse 18. The response is, why does He punish you for your sins? Nay, no, you are but mortals that He created. So the Quran goes out of its way to say, Allah is the Father to no one, and Jesus is definitely not His Son. But the chapter He quoted, Jesus is the Son, whom the Father glorifies in the same way that the Son glorifies Him. So if we just believe, if we just believe the, the passage, not even the whole book, not even the whole just chapter, it, if we it. just believe the paragraph that, that Joshua Evans <laughs> quoted to us, Allah is against us, He's going to destroy us, and according to the verse before, you, you cited 930, 929, Muslims have to violently subjugate us and kill if we do not submit to Precisely. Islamic authority because of yeah. our belief in, got, this, yeah. in this verse that he quoted. Yep. To interesting to stuff, Joshua. Yeah. yeah, interesting. All right, but he has another verse where Jesus is denying that he's divine, just like in this passage yeah. where he says he had glory with the Father before the world was and that he gives eternal life, just like this passage that Joshua quoted where Jesus clearly denies his deity. Uh, Joshua has another verse for us where Jesus is going to deny his deity. Let's have a look. 
And then also he told, uh, when, after he was uh, in, in the Bible, when he ascended to God, he told, he told them, he said, Jesus saith unto her, he's speaking to Mary Magdalene, I ascend unto my father and your father, my God and your God. He very clearly equated her God and his God as being the one and same God. He didn't say, I'm going to ascend to myself. Well, um, certainly wish Joshua would have bothered to finish that chapter, right? Uh, check out what he says to his disciple Thomas, uh, if you want to see what Jesus says to Mary. But uh, let, let me go ahead and agree with him for a moment. Let's see what he is um, saying. So this is from John chapter 20, and this is after the resurrection, and uh, Jesus uh, encounters Mary in the garden. And I'll begin in verse 15 just to give you the context here, and then Sam can reply to it. Uh, verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. Well, there you have it, Sam. Yes, we will ignore all the rest yes. of the book of John. We will ignore how it begins. We'll ignore everything Jesus says. We'll ignore the rest of the chapter where Thomas calls him my Lord and my God. Jesus does say here that he is going to his God. He can't be going to himself, right? Precisely, yeah. He can't be going to himself. So Jesus has a God. Is this news to us? Is it news to us wow, that shocked. Jesus has a God? I have never heard this before. Uh, but all joking aside, this again shows me either he's ignorant of the doctrine that he's criticizing or he knows better and he's misrepresenting it. But only God knows his heart. And we ask the Lord Jesus to grant him repentance to come back to Jesus and abandon Islam because number one, which Christian who is a Trinitarian, let me qualify that because we do have Christians who are modalists. Which Trinitarian believes that Jesus is the same person that he's ascending to? There he tells you he's ascending to the Father. No Trinitarian believes Jesus is the Father. So that's a distortion of what we believe. He keeps assuming that there's only one person who's God. And since the Father is God and Jesus is distinct from him, Jesus can't be God or he'd be the Father. But that again begs the question. The reason why we're Trinitarians is because the Bible denies that there's only one divine person. The Bible says there is only one God, one infinite being of God, but the Bible reveals three eternally distinct divine persons existing as the one God. So I have no problem with Jesus ascending to the Father because he's not ascending to himself, he's ascending to the Father who's a different person from him. But that brings me back to the second point. In this same verse, Jesus again affirms that God is his Father and the Father of his followers, the disciples. But chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran says, the Messiah is not the Son of Allah, and that Allah will fight us for believing that. Chapter 5, verse 18 says that the Christians say that they are the sons of Allah and His beloved, and it denies it by saying, no, you are but mortals that He created. So if I am to believe this verse, I can't be a Muslim. If, I to, um, I, if I'm to believe Jesus, that God is His Father and the Father of His followers, then that means I must reject Muhammad as a false prophet who says Allah is a father to no one, Jesus is not his son. Now that we got that out of the way, as a Christian who believes in what the Bible teaches in total, I believe in all of Scripture, and I believe whatever Scripture teaches, the Scriptures are quite clear that the eternal Word, John 1.1, 1, 1, the eternal Word, the agent of creation, who is God in essence, becomes a flesh and blood human being. John 1.14 is clear. The Word became flesh. The Father did not become flesh. The Holy Spirit did not become flesh. The Son became flesh and lived among us. The Father remained exalted in glory in heaven. Now, Jeremiah 32, 27 says the following, and I'm going to ask you a question, Dave. Maybe you can help me understand this. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Here we're told that Yahweh is the God of all flesh. Now, if one member of the Trinity becomes flesh, should it surprise us and shock us that another member would then become his God? Of course not. We well, would expect it, right? If you've got the incarnation, this is exactly what you have. And since we have the incarnation, the Son becomes flesh. Why would it shock us that the Son honors the Father as his God, who has now become flesh, when God, God is the God of all flesh? Yes, according to Joshua, uh, if the Trinity were true, and the Son did enter creation, 
well, then the son should be an atheist. He should yeah. be an atheist, right? He, exactly. should, he, shouldn't, yeah. he shouldn't have a God, Basically, right? right? Yeah, yeah, that's the perfect man is an atheist. Yeah. And then as you noted, same chapter, right? Mm -hmm. John 20, 28 to 29. Thomas answered and said to him, there is no getting around the grammar of the Greek. It is ins in inescapable. He's addressing this act of worship to Jesus. To him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Notice, he doesn't say, shame on you. Didn't you get it? Didn't Mary Magdalene tell you, the Father is your God, not me? No, you have seen me and you believe that I'm your God. Amen. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. So notice, this sure sounds like what a Trinitarian expects to find. Mm -hmm. The Father is our God and so is the Son, even though they're distinct persons. Mm -hmm. Would you expect to find this if you're a Trinitarian? Um, this is exactly what I expect to find if I were a Trinitarian. And that's, that's what's so interesting. If, if we approach this as Unitarians, right? As Unitarians, we would say, this just does not make sense. Exactly this right. does not make sense. This only, the, 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 the Gospel of John, the Gospels in general, the Bible as a whole, does not make sense without the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Incarnation. Once you have those doctrines, even though they're beyond your comprehension, even though you can't understand everything about God, as both the Bible and the Quran declare, even though you can't understand these fully, the whole thing makes sense after that, right? The scriptures make sense because then you see exactly how uh, all of these verses tie together. And that's why we're Trinitarians and not Muslims. Precisely. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at one more clip during this show. And this is going to be an interesting one. We're going to have to look at several passages because Joshua is going to um, tell us what the term Son of God really means. It has nothing to do with deity. So let's go ahead and look at our last clip for the evening. Number three is that even when you get to the title Son of God, even when you get the title Only Begotten Son of God, this is not an exclusive title to Jesus Christ, which many people think. There are many, 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 many instances where the word Son of God is used. And if anyone would study Jewish culture, especially ancient Jewish culture or Orthodox Jewish culture, to be called a Son of God is, is a title of esteem and a title of prestige and honor, even being called Lord. Well, I think he's got us there because yeah. there are different uses of Son of God in the Bible, right? Precisely. And right. many people in the Bible are called sons of God. Yeah. In fact, we're sons of God, aren't we? Exactly. As we we're saying. sons of God, and we're not, we're not God, right? Precisely. And you even have, uh, if you do certain things in the Bible, you could be described as a, as a son of God. Let me give you an example. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called sons of God. That doesn't mean you're going to be God, right? It doesn't mean you're going to be God if you're the son of God. Exactly, yeah. No, that's, that, I can't argue against that. Well, so then that, uh, has he refuted us? Because Jesus, Jesus, Jesus claims to be the son of God, right? Precisely. So, so if he's claiming to be the son of God, and son of God does not entail deity, well, this, term, this, this phrase son of God, this title, just has nothing to do with deity. Isn't that correct? What, what, what are some other examples of how son of God is used in the Bible, Sam? You've got spirit beings who are called the sons of God. Angels, Israel. the angels, yeah, right? Exactly. Sons angels. of God came. Sons of God. A Israel as a whole nation collectively is called the Son of God. Israel Exodus is called the Son of God, yeah, yeah. right? The whole nation, Ephraim it's a nation. Is called the Son of God. Adam is the Son of God because he was directly created by God. So, I mean, man, we got sons and by Paul, the sons Paul, of God. Paul, Paul, Paul even says that we're all children of God because in yes. him we live and move and have our being, You right? got it. And he's quoting so, a Greek poet, right? A pagan? Yeah, so people can be sons of God in all kinds of different senses because yeah. if you're thinking of God as the source of something, right? If you're thinking of God as the source, God brought the nation of Israel into existence, right? So he's its father. He's, he's the, the father of the nation in that sense. God brings Adam into existence. He's Adam's father in that sense, right? Exactly. And, and you can be a, a son of God in a different sense. If you're a peacemaker, it's that you're, you're somehow reflecting God's nature to exactly. the world. You're, you're, you're doing God's will. You're a son of God in that sense. And so there are all kinds of uses of sons of God in the Bible. Why would we ever think that yeah. this phrase, this mm. term, Son of God has anything to do with deity. Joshua has said, well, it doesn't. We're let, wrong. Well, let me think about it. Let me read Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. See why I've come to the conclusion that although there are sons of God, and as Ahmad Didat was you know, known to infamously uh, retort, God has sons by the tons. Jesus doesn't simply cl claim to be a son of God in the same sense as the rest. He claims to be the unique son of God who is essentially co-equal with the Father. So although there are many sons of God, there is no other son like Christ because Christ describes his sonship in such a way that makes him essentially co-equal with the Father. Now let me prove it. I just made an assertion. 
Let's see whether that assertion is backed up by Scripture. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Now, Dave, can you imagine any other son saying that? No. You know of any other son saying, hey, no one knows me, the Son, except the Father? No. Because that implies that that person's claiming to be incomprehensible, right? Mm -hmm. And it requires someone like God to be able to know and understand him. But now notice what he goes on to say. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Here Christ says he is the Son who knows the Father in the same way that the Father knows him, and therefore he is the only one qualified to reveal God to mankind. Does that sound like he's claiming to be just a son of God or a son of God like the rest? Or the unique son of God who is just as incomprehensible as the father is and his knowledge of the father and the father's knowledge of him is reciprocal and therefore infinite and omniscient. That's certainly what it sounds like. Right. And even when you have the Trinitarian formulas in the Bible, which Joshua doesn't seem to know about, he seems to have no clue that these passages even exist, but uh, let me read to you the Great Commission. So this is how Jesus sends out his followers. So according to the Quran, they're all Muslims, right? This is how the Muslim prophet Jesus sends out his followers, according to the Bible, which Joshua keeps quoting to defend his position. This is how Jesus, when he's leaving, sends out his disciples. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Now he's supposed to say, hey, stop worshipping me, right? But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here Jesus is worshipped. He's with his followers forever meaning he is eternal and omnipresent because he's with his followers here, he's with his followers everywhere. Um, and they are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this use of Son of God is inserted alongside Father and Holy Spirit divine entities, in the yeah. name, the one name of God, yeah. and all authority on hev in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. Is this just claiming to be the Son of God in the sense of, well, blessed are the peacemakers, they're sons of God? Definitely not. You, God, create, God created all of us, we're all God's Definitely children. Is, that, yeah. is, this, is this unique here Definitely or not? not? He's claiming to be the Son who shares the same divine authority, essence, characteristics that the Father and Holy Spirit possesses. He claims to be the Son who's omnipresent, present with all believers and omnipotent, because he, that statement is made in the context of the Great Commission. He's ensuring them. They will be successful in making disciples of all nations because he will be personally present with them, not physically present, but personally present with them in order to ensure their success, that their mission is successful. So that's a claim to omnipresence, omnipotence, and that he forever lives because in order for, for him to be with all his followers, no matter where they're at till the end of the age, he must forever be living and present everywhere. I don't know of any other son who's omnipresent, omnipotent, ever living, who shares the same divine nature, characteristics, and authority of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Do you know of any other? No. And now let me show you how this contradicts the Quran again. We've already demonstrated that Allah has no son and Jesus is in his son. But notice Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. I, the Son of God, who is one with the Father and the Spirit. I, the Son of God, one with the Father and the Spirit. All authority has been given to me. So he's the sovereign Lord of all creation. That's basically what he's saying. I'm the king of creation. I'm the sovereign of creation. Chapter 17, verse 111 of the Quran. And say, praise be to Allah, who has not taken unto himself a son, and who has no partner in his sovereignty. So Allah has no son and has no partner in his sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty. Jesus is the son who shares in his father's sovereignty over the entire creation. Again, if I'm to follow the teachings of Christ, I cannot be a Muslim. How in the world did this former Christian youth pastor who read these passages abandon the teachings of Christ to embrace the message of Islam when Islam denies the fatherhood of God and the divine sonship of Christ? How in the world did he do that? I don't know. Yeah. Right? And uh, just to point out, the difference between Joshua, who seems to have no familiarity with the scriptures except what he got from like Ahmed Didat or something like that, um, the difference between him and the people of Jesus' time is the people of Jesus' time understood what he was saying. Exactly. And let me give you an example. Um, when Jesus was calling, referring to God as his father, people of his time understood this. And I would invite everyone to read the entirety of John chapter 5. But let me just read their interpretation of this. Well, this is after Jesus made the claim. 
that uh, he's actually allowed to do things on the Sabbath that hu other human beings are not allowed to do on the Sabbath because God is his Father. So in verse 17, it says, Jesus answered them when they accuse him of working on the Sabbath. He says, my Father is working until now, and I myself am working. So the, the, the rabbis had a discussion. Uh, even though people aren't allowed to work on the Sabbath, God is still working because he's sustaining the entire universe. And Jesus says, I get to do that too. He gets to do that too. Well, you don't get to do that as a human being. You get to do that as God. Now watch their reaction. Verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Exactly. And if you like a little more understanding of how Jesus is trying to get people to understand uh, Son of God, um, let's look at his trial very quickly. Um, this is Mark chapter 14, and I'll begin at verse 61. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Is that something a mere human being could say? Definitely not. Is that something a king of Israel could say? No. In fact, the Quran itself agrees that coming on the clouds is a divine uh, function. Because in chapter 2, verse 2, 210 of the Quran, chapter 2, verse 210, notice what it says, speaking about the Jews. And notice what the Jews are expecting and anticipating. Do they then wait for anything other than that Allah should come to them in the shadows of the clouds and the angels? Did you notice that? That at the time of Muhammad, the Jews were anticipating that God would show up in the clouds with angels, showing you that even Muhammad's Jewish contemporaries realize that this is a divine function. Riding the clouds is a divine function. And to further solidify that Jesus' claim shows that he's claiming to be God in human form. Mark 13, 26, 27, he speaks of himself as the Son of Man, who will send forth his angels, send forth the angels to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. Notice he's the Son of Man who comes with the clouds, accompanied by angels. The very thing that Quran chapter 2, verse 210 says is what Allah does. So there is no way a prophet could say this because no prophet can ascribe such a function to himself. Now, we would expect, we would, we would expect a youth pastor to have some familiarity of the different kinds of uses of Son of God in the Bible, wouldn't we? Precisely. If, if it's a Muslim who has no familiarity with the Bible, and he reads that Jesus calls himself the Son of God, and then hears, well, Israel's called the Son of God, or Adam's called the Son of, Son of God, we can understand a Muslim saying, oh, okay, well, when Jesus says he's the Son of God, doesn't mean he's divine, because other people are called Son of God, too. Precisely. But when a youth pastor who's read these passages and knows, should know, that the way Jesus is using Son of God is very different from the, from the way other people are using it. And people want to stone him to death for blasphemy when he makes this claim about himself. Exactly, yeah. And that this, at, at his Jewish trial, this is what actually gets him the Jewish conviction, right? They haul him off to the Romans to try and get him executed. But this is what upset them, right? Jesus calling himself the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, fact, the Son of God. Let me just confirm. Look what they said to Pilate. John 19.7, to confirm, this is why they want him killed. John 19.7, the Jews answered him, we have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Mm -hmm. What? But there are many sons of God. Yeah, we're all sons of God, according to uh, Joshua. Yeah. Oh, no, see, this is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, I said that was the last clip, but I actually wanted to look at the next one because it actually relates to this. Okay, He's, he, 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 yeah, he, yeah it, it relates to the Son of God. So we have a few minutes left. Let's look at this last clip and see. <laughs> I, I, I just don't understand how? I mean, this tells me something about the state of churches nowadays, if this is what passes uh, for a knowledgeable youth pastor. Let's take a look at the next clip. I had a discussion with a uh, pastor about this. He said, yes, but Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. And I said, okay, what gives him that exclusive title? What is the characteristic that gives him that exclusive title? He says the New Testament says that, yes, but there must be a reason why he has this exclusive title. He says because he was born miraculously without a father, and in, and in Jewish culture, your lineage was from your father's side. You know, you, you, would, you would be the son of your father, of his father. That's how your lineage was traced, not through the mother. So therefore, since his lineage stopped in Mary, he had no father, therefore God must be his father. I said, okay, that makes sense. That would make sense to an average human being. I said, but if that is the characteristic for his exclusive sonship, that he has no father, I said, what about Adam and Eve? They had no father nor mother. They were fashioned, as God says, by his own hands out of dirt. 
And now, Sam. Yes. I've heard from many Muslims, but I've never heard from a Christian, that when we say only yeah. begotten Son of God, we mean, well, Jesus had a mother but no father. And exactly. that's what we mean, right? No, You've heard that yeah. from Muslims, right? I've heard it from Muslims. That's why I'm surprised. Ha have you yeah. ever heard a Christian say that's what we mean by only begotten son? Not, not personally. I mean, you know, I've never, I, I've I don't never know. heard that yeah. from anyone but Muslims, and yet every Muslim seems to know these Christians who are out there saying yeah. that when the Bible says Jesus is the only begotten son, that, that all we're saying is, well, he had no father, therefore God is his father, therefore he's the only begotten son. And then, of course, the objection follows, well, what about Adam? The, right. Adam would be the only begotten son, too, Oh, we got right? you there. In fact, he'd be a greater son of God, the argument goes, because he had neither father nor mother. So he's a greater son of God, right? So why don't you worship Adam? Why don't you bow to Adam? Why don't you acknowledge Adam's divinity? Well, number one, going back to that objection, and this, this by the way, this objection with comparing Jesus to Adam is not unique to Yusha Evans. It's actually a chronic argument. It's found in chapter 3, verse 59, where it says, the similitude, the likeness of Allah, a Jesus in the sight of Allah, is like that of Adam. He said to him, be, and he is. Chapter 3, verse 59 of the Quran. The similitude, the likeness of Jesus in the sight of Allah. How does Allah see Jesus? Allah views Jesus the same as he does Adam. Because to Adam, right, he created him, right, with the word be. Said to him be, and he was, or he is. Kun fayakun. Problem with that is, when Adam was created, he was the first man. There were no human beings prior to him. There was no couple before him. So the circumstances in which Adam was created necessitated that he'd be the first man without parents. Correct? Mm -hmm. If, if he had parents, then he wouldn't be the first man, right? Right. Then it would parents be his would be. father who would be the progenitor of the human race. Same thing with Eve. Eve is the first woman. How could she have a mother? I mean, if she's the first woman, then that means there could, she couldn't have a mother. So the circumstances in which they were created, being the first human couple, those circumstances necessitated that in the case of Adam, he doesn't have parents. He's mm -hmm. the first man. And Eve doesn't have parents, doesn't have a mother. She's the first woman. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when we come to Christ, Thousands, if not billions of years, I don't know how many years you want to posit between Adam and Jesus, had transpired, which the natural process of sexual procreation had been instituted, and human beings were being born the natural way through sexual intercourse. Yet all of a sudden, God decides to override this process and cause Jesus to be conceived supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit to a virgin who gives birth to him while a virgin in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the question is not, does the virgin birth make Jesus son of God? No informed Christian believes that. Jesus is not the son of God because of the virgin birth. The question is, why would God cause Jesus to be conceived and born supernaturally to, the, to a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? <clears throat> if there wasn't something unique about him, it's because of who he is. That's why he came into the world the way he did. The virgin birth doesn't make him the son of God because he is the son of God. This was the only befitting way for him to enter into our creation. See, that's the argument. I don't know if anyone would say the virgin birth makes him the son of God. Yeah, so even if there had never been a virgin birth, and even if Jesus had never entered into creation, from all eternity he is the son. He Precisely. is the divine son. It's because he's the eternal son. That's why he entered the way he did, a and befitting manner to his glory and majesty. And so when Muslims give us this argument, oh, you Christians say that Jesus is the son of God because he's born of a virgin. They either don't know what they're talking about, or they've talked to some not very bright Christians, right? Yeah, Yusha Evans probably was one of them. And and and, a Christian pastor. and 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 I mean, think about that. He said he says he heard this from someone. Okay, well, assuming you heard this from someone, how would you, as a as a former youth pastor, not know what the, what we actually teach, what yeah. what Christianity actually teaches? It's like Joshua is saying to everyone, guys, um, I've never actually studied this. I haven't read the Bible very carefully. I looked around at a few passages. I've never made any attempt to understand this theologically. I have no clue what Orthodox Christian theology teaches. I've never bothered to read a theology book. I have no clue what Christians mean by the doctrine. I know it's got something to do with three and one or something like that, but other than that, I have no clue what, what the doctrine of the Trinity is. I have, made no under I have made no attempt to seriously understand any of this, I have never talked to an authoritative source or someone who is knowledgeable. I've only talked to the guy over there, and he didn't know what, the, what only begotten son meant. That's what I've done. Basically, no attempt whatsoever to understand what Christianity teaches, and I don't understand it. Imagine that. I don't understand something I've made no attempt to understand. Guys, I don't understand quantum mechanics. I've never studied it. I don't understand calculus. I've, ne I've never bothered to, under to, under you know, to study calculus. 
I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how lights work. I've never bothered to understand how electricity works, but I don't understand how these light works. I, I don't understand any of this. I've never made any attempt to understand it, and I just don't get it. Well, it's, it's really shocking that someone who has made no attempt to understand something would not understand it. Precisely. All right, that's our show. <laughs> that's our show. Uh, join us next time where we're going to finish uh, Joshua's arguments against the deity of Christ, and we'll see. Hasn't been doing well so far, has exhibited a profound ignorance of the scriptures and horrible distortions of basic Christian positions. But uh, maybe he'll surprise us with his last few arguments. Maybe we'll see something that is able to show that Christians really have a problem. Find out next time on Jesus or Muhammad. <laughs>